and fail miserably at it, I'm sure. Because you know, there's probably a bunch Whoa. of... Oh, wow. <laughs> there's probably a bunch of, uh, you know, eight-year-olds oh, that are really good at this game. <laughs> and there she goes. There shouldn't we he, go. Shouldn't have, shouldn't have brought that banana on board. Yep, yeah. it was a banana. Bad luck. <laughs>
is not a good fellow, for she's a golly good fellow. <laughs> Nobody can deny. Well, All I, right. And so, yeah. you, as you can see, my, my guy has an eye patch. And uh, I have, I think, flip-flops on. Maybe that's accurate. Um, a, I have a poor pirate. Well, actually, and, what's uh, what's the instrument you're playing? Uh, I don't know. It's some type of... What is that? I'm not a musical... I know what a guitar is. It's definitely not a guitar. I, I would have known, like, yesterday, I think. <laughs> For some reason, I can't remember. I got a fishing pole, too. Oh, my like gosh. Game. It's on the tip of my tongue, but I can't. <laughs> yeah, I know. Me too. Yeah, I'm not sure. It doesn't really say what it is either in the no. game. No. But it is a real instrument. I'm looking it up because that's going to bug me. I know. <laughs> and then we got one of these. You got to have one of these. Accordion. Yep. Classic. Yep. So lots of music taking place in this game. So that's that's a nice little fun thing. I, I think, um, you know, one of my favorite pirate video games even to this day and it's probably just because you know childhood but was i don't know if you ever played sid meyer's pirates gold mm -hmm. i think it was on i think it was originally on either an i think nintendo i know at one point it was on nintendo and then later on i think pirates gold was on sega genesis but that game uh actually has some fairly good information it's also got a lot of bad information in it about about pirates, but I still think that's one of my favorite pirate games of all time. But the, the game Assassin's Creed Black Flag, they actually have really good um, sea shanties uh, on that game. And you can find you can find those either, of course, you, you know, in the gameplay, or if you go to YouTube, you can actually watch all the sea shanties and, and hear them. And they are real, uh, I, I know, I don't know if all of them are real, but I know a large number of them are real sea shanties that they, uh, you know, that certainly were sung in the early 1800s, late 1700s. So if you're looking for real sea shanties, not just... Uh, <laughs> well, some I of just, these, I think, are real. Some of them are made for the game. Yeah. Um, All right, so in this game, uh, of course, you can pick, when you start out, um, you can pick different weapons. So uh, right now I have a cutlass, which, you know, of course, cutlasses were real, and they, they were used by... Uh, not just pirates, but naval personnel and even just, you know, people on merchant vessels who wanted to defend their ship against pirates. Um, and then we've, of course, we, we have a little, I have a, what looks like a flintlock pistol, mm -hmm. which I think flintlocks date from the later 1700s and then all throughout the early 1800s. Um, or typically, I think flintlocks. And they might have dated it back a little bit earlier than that, but definitely not 1600s. So this, this would have been a little bit later in time. And then, of course, we have the, the ship. We have a couple uh, cannons on board. We actually have two on this one. What do you but think of the this... ship, Nicole? Well, I would say, like... you know, do we, have a, do we have a type for the ship? They call it a sloop. A sloop. Okay, yeah. It might be a little bit on the small side as far as uh, the width, uh, uh -huh. what we maritime folk call the beam of the ship but yeah i mean i think probably the way you're getting up and down the decks on the ship may not be 100 percent accurate uh, maybe more ladders yeah probably more ladders than like physical staircases mm -hmm. although having a staircase up to the quarter deck where you are right now would have been a thing yeah um, and the quarter deck would have been for the captains and the officers usually only up here you mean yes you should take her up to the crow's nest you can actually oh, yeah. go the top of the mast. Oh, so this would be our main mast here. This is our only mast on this one. This is our only one, yeah. The only mast. And they also have they have galleons, which um, are if we didn't choose a galleon because with just two people, those are really hard to control. Um, because you have, I think you have three masts on the galleons in this game, and then when you're actually sailing, and we'll do that in just a minute, I guess. It's I, I do like the um, the the dynamics of the sailing and how you have to to uh, you know have, you have to lower the sails and you have to trim the sails to catch the wind for it to actually get moving. But that's a lot easier on this little small sloop. Yeah, that's accurate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so real quick, the instrument is a concertina. Concert oh, concertina. Okay. 
And then uh, Barbara had a question. Have you found any weapons on ships, Nicole? Any on weapons on ships? Yeah, I mean, I guess it depends if you're talking about me personally or just in general. Um, me personally, no. But I have worked on shipwreck sites where we have found different kinds of armament. Um, probably one of the best and probably most popular examples would be um, the 1559 Spanish shipwrecks that are in Pensacola, Florida. And fun fact, Pensacola, Florida in Pensacola Bay, it's home to the second oldest shipwrecks uh, in the United States, if we're counting just European shipwrecks, of course. Booyah. Yeah, <laughs> right here in Pensacola Bay. They're only in about 12 to 15 feet of water. And uh, they, they weren't uh, vessels for warfare or anything like that. They were actually coming here in 1559 from Veracruz, Mexico to establish a new colony. The Spanish were really worried about the French and the British making inroads into what is now Florida. And so this was kind of their attempt to do that. And be although they were coming to establish a colony, they brought lots of really practical things with them to build that colony. They were also brought weapons with them too because they knew that earlier Spanish expeditions had not made very good friends with the locals. Um, and of course, you always have to watch out for those darn uh, French and British in the area. So we find things. Um, we haven't found physical cannon, but we found uh, gun carriage wheels. So those, you can kind of see it on this little sloop we've got. The like wheels. Kind of lanterns on. And I've turned a couple of lanterns <laughs> on, which is very dangerous in this game <laughs> at nighttime because then people could see you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. but you can see there's some little wheels on that. We found it's a wooden wheel, so something kind of similar. Um, we found stone cannonballs. So some of those really early um, ships, iron was expensive and hard to create. And you could put someone on the task of carving out stone cannonballs for punishment on a ship, especially on a long expedition. So we have found things like that as well, which is pretty cool. How is the cannon mounting on these? Pretty decent? Pretty lacking? I think they would have needed to have some place to tie these suckers down because... Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, you fight, th there's not a lot of space in between these two guns. And so whoever's standing behind it would die if they both fired at the same time. Yeah, the so kickback on those is pretty good. Yeah, they, they can kick yeah. pretty hard. That would probably flip over the way. And these are fairly large guns for a sloop. Yeah. Most pirate ships, I know, really, at least from the late 1700s and into the early 1800s, and that's what I'm a little bit more familiar with. But most pirate ships in real life, wouldn't have been as heavily armed with guns, with, with cannons, as much as you would have would think. Um, because the goal was not to blow the other, the, the, the ship that you're trying to capture the, or the prize. It was not to blow it to smithereens or to sink it. The goal was to slow it down and then board it. So then you could steal everything on board or even steal the ship itself. That's, that was, were also pretty valuable. So uh, pirate ships, uh, at least during the later 1700s, early eight, early 1800s, tended to be like sloops or schooners, like like this one, and they weren't they weren't heavily on, as heavily armed as a like a naval warship would have been. Of course, they would have had a lot of small arms, so swords and pistols and blunderbuss, which is kind of like a early version of a shotgun. Uh, those those certainly were and axes, boarding axes would have all been they would have had been heavily armed with that. Um, but they typically didn't carry a lot of cannons. Although I know some pirate shipwrecks that they have identified um, did carry a good number of cannon, but I think it kind of depends on the size too. Well, and uh, I think an important thing about a pirate ship is it has to be fast, right? Because you yeah, want to outrun absolutely. all those heavily armed uh, military ships. Yeah. You don't Speaking of fast, man the helm. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get out of here. He's weighing anchor there. Um, anchor's I, away. Right. You, you want to take the helm you or you want ahead. me to take it? You go okay, ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll, you, uh, you take the sails. All so the what we can the... also do is we can, um, let's sail by the shipwreck. There are a number of shipwrecks in this game that you can actually dive on. And so I think oh. maybe we can, let's go out to sea for a little bit and when we'll come back and we can actually dive on this wreck and see what we find on it. So is that what the Pensacola wrecks look like right there? <laughs> I'm not going to say that they can't look like that, but they don't look like that. <laughs> <laughs> also, that ship is like pointing straight down in the sand. Something very violent happened to that ship. Well, it could well have this been area a... is 
frequented by pirates. So. And, and sharks as big as this ship. So Yeah, before we started, I, I was going to go Actually, check the yeah. shipwreck out to see if I could just see what was on it. And I was eaten by a shark. So, a small shark, though. A small shark. And I also found out in this game something that is not accurate. And that is, uh, I could actually fire my flintlock pistol underwater, which I'm pretty <laughs> yeah. sure you can't do in real life. Yeah. Black powder <laughs> and wetness do not uh, mix Don't very well. Go. Couple and more the term, questions. Keep your powder dry. Uh, that's where that comes from. Couple more questions from the chat. All right. Um, Nicole, does uh, Saint Augustine have shipwrecks similar to Pensacola's? Oh, that's a great question. So. Actually, so just to give a little bit of historical context, after the settlement in Pensacola was abandoned, so those 1559 shipwrecks wrecked because of a hurricane, um, the Spanish eventually abandoned Pensacola because it just didn't work out. Um, and they decided to try somewhere else. And one of the places that was selected was St. Augustine. And so St. Augustine, that's why it gets the title of longest continuously settled <laughs> in the u.s um, qualifier but, qualifier 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 yeah, lots of qualifiers yeah <laughs> whereas the, but, uh, whereas pensacola is the first multi-year settlement attempt in north america it has its own not, <laughs> not if you not if you drive into downtown pensacola the sign clearly says america's first settlement so yeah <laughs> for those who don't know those two cities are often bickering about who's first yeah. so yeah. we're kind of having a little fun there so well, St. Augustine, you know, they they didn't have the disaster that Pensacola did. So we don't really have any identified shipwrecks um, with that initial settlement period from the Spanish. Um, but St. Augustine has its own kind of very unique history. And we do have shipwrecks there, um, some from a little bit later period when Florida was in a state of flux um, when the British were here and uh, were being threatened by the Spanish during the American Revolution which is kind of interesting. But a lot of British uh, royalists and loyalists were being evacuated from other parts of the thir what would become the 13 colonies um, to Florida as a safe haven. And so we do see some shipwrecks in St. Augustine from that period. And those are primarily being studied by um, the St. Augustine Lighthouse um, Archaeology, wait, is LAMP is their acronym, St. Augustine Lighthouse and Maritime Archaeology Program. Um, but yeah, so they've done some really excellent work and they actually have some really cool exhibits at their museum in St. Augustine. Um, definitely recommend checking that out. And I think they have some good information online as well. Cool. Yeah, we, um, the, one of the, those wrecks, uh, the industry shipwreck was a British merchant or yeah, it was a British ship that sank in St. Augustine and the, um, during the kind of American revolutionary time period. Uh, we have some of those artifacts on display at our, museum in Pensacola. Mm -hmm. So we do have some stuff from St. Augustine in Pensacola on display. And maybe they have stuff from Pensacola on, on I feel like that would be a good diplomatic thing <laughs> for us to like, yeah, talk about each other. You know, like we might have a little bit of fun making fun of who's, who's first, but we're both awesome. So I will say the difference between Pensacola and St. Augustine is that the diving and the maritime archaeology in Pensacola is much kinder to divers and archaeologists. Really? The Atlantic coast is a lot rougher mm. and cloudier and murkier and harder to deal with. Um, and we're lucky that the 1559 shipwrecks we work with here in Pensacola are in Pensacola Bay. So it's even more protected and relatively shallow. So that's given us, I think, probably more opportunities than they have over on the East Coast uh, to do archaeology year round, which is kind of cool. I understand the water is pretty murky still, though. Uh, yeah, it's <laughs> it's pretty murky here, too, but uh, but not as tidally dependent. And we don't have to deal with the craziness of the Atlantic Ocean like mm. they do. Over there. Uh, another question. Were there female pirates? Oh, yeah. Uh. <laughs> Oh, you Mike, want me? You want to yeah. Take, yeah, Mike, you got this. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, the answer is yes. There, there are a couple um, a really uh, well-documented um, instances of female pirates, and those mainly come from um, uh, a book that was published in the early 1700s um, called A General History of Pirates uh, by the, uh, an alias writer named Captain Charles. There's some speculation on the true identity 
of who the author was, but it's, it's, um, it's backed up by some other court documentation. So the, the two female pirates, Anne Bonnie and Mary Reed, um, they certainly were involved in piracy in what's called the golden age of piracy. Uh, so the golden age, historians like to break different, you know, we like to have order and, and make time periods. So it just makes things nice and neat. So that's during a period of piracy that's generally considered to be called the golden age of piracy, which basically dates from, depending on what source you go to, the you know, 1680s, 1690s, all the way to about the 1720s or 1730s. It's, and that's just when the piracy was the, uh, a real major problem in the Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico in, in particular. But uh, yeah, and there, there are some other uh, instances of female pirates in history um, that you can find really all over the world, in, in China, in Europe, in, in Ireland. Um, some pretty well-known examples of that. However, I will say that uh, it, it was not common. And in fact, that's why it was so sensational when those, and that's why it was so heavily publicized when the Anne Bonnie and Mary Reed were um, tried in court for uh, participating and being involved in piracy. Uh, that's, that's why it, it was so popular is because it was so out of the ordinary um, to happen. But, it, but to answer that question, yeah, it did certainly happen, just wasn't super common. Cool. So here's a canon question you may know. Looks like this canon is, uh, I think you'd call it breech loaded. However, they it, it probably would have been muzzle loaded. Is no, that correct? this was this is a muzzle loaded. This is not a breech. Breech loaded means you load the um, projectile from the back. Right. It would actually in the back part of it would actually open up, and then you load it that oh, way. That's that's where this, you load is what I'm saying. That one. This one you know. load. It looks like you load. Well, I, yeah, I guess in the game. Maybe it, they're not it, clear on that. Yeah, it doesn't really. It doesn't show you open anything, but you, you do in the game load from the back. And it doesn't um, look but, like it opens, I guess. This doesn't look like it actually opens, so I'd say that the mechanics is wrong for this. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that's correct. The breach is from the back. The um, muzzle load is, would be from the, from the front portion of it or from the, what's called the muzzle of the gun or the cannon. So here's the chain shot. I kind of like it. Ooh, oh, chain yeah. Shot. Yeah, hopefully we can find us a, uh, a, a ship and we can attack it and not feel bad about it because if they're sailing in this game, they are, they are pirates. So <laughs> It's a given. Or, pi or a pirate given. skeletons, either way. That's right. We'll find something. I was hoping maybe we should go into a storm and see if we can, how we fare in that weather. Yeah, get some holes in the ship. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> uh, actually, speaking of holes, do, do we have any water in the, uh, in the holes? Uh, good question. Let's go look. An another inaccurate thing about this game is is they have. I think it's so funny because they have you go down and there's like you can, there's a pump to pump in water to drink, but there's not a pump to pump the water out. No bilge <laughs> pump. Yeah. Yeah, you have to you have to use a bucket. <laughs> that so, would be inefficient. Yeah. So I guess that's a good question. What is? Can you tell us, Nicole? What is a a bilge pump? A bilge pump, it's basically, I mean, it's essentially a pump like that, but it would be connected probably deeper in the hold of the ship so that if you, I don't know, scraped onto a hard coral reef or scraped a sandbar and got a crack in your ship's hull, you'd be able to pump out any water that started flooding in. Um, but essentially, I mean, it functions the same way as that, that freshwater pump does, but... But yeah, those would have been really important to have on ships. And I think there are two different kinds you had um, ones that could be moved around the ship, and you had some that could also that were built into the ship itself. Oh yeah, critical okay. critical piece of equipment. Right. Yeah, yeah you got to have that. And man, what a crappy job to <laughs> have to work that bilge pump. I think usually, you know, if it was a really bad leak and they're trying desperately to get into port, you would do shifts all day long. Yeah, pretty terrible. But there was if you didn't do it, you would die. A few years ago, uh, there was a tall ship, a replica tall ship, that was the, the captain uh, took the vessel out because he thought he thought it would be safe. It sounds like, yeah, I was going to drop anchor and say we could check it out. But there was a captain who, um, who was on a tall ship, and then he, his theory was that uh, <laughs> there was a hurricane or a large storm coming on the East Coast, and that he thought the best thing that they could do was take the ship out to sea and kind of uh, ride it out there. Mm -hmm. And um, unfortunately, the the ship, uh, the I believe the, the the pumps were actually run by diesel engines, and they, I guess they failed, 
And so uh -huh. the, they couldn't pump the water out and uh, the, the Coast Guard was able to actually rescue most of the crew, but the captain stayed on board um, and the, the ship actually sank and the captain, I can't remember the name of that tall ship, but the captain actually perished um, on, on board that ship. But it was because the, the bilge pumps failed. Um, and of course, I'm not sure why they didn't have, I know I, know a, I had read an article about it uh, after this incident took place and there was some investigations. And from what I remember, um, the captain was asking the Coast Guard to just basically to, to send down some, some new diesel, like some generators so they could power the bilge pumps, but it was just too dangerous. Are um, you talking about the one that was during Hurricane Sandy? Yeah, I think that's the one. Yeah. That was kind of funnily named, it was the HMS Bounty. Bounty, that's right. That's, yep. that's what it was, yeah. yeah. And it was an unfortunate, but that was because those pumps had failed. I believe that's, that's what happened from what I remember reading, at least from initial reports. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, they are, you're right, they're critical pieces of equipment. So I have always wondered this, how did you like our dropping anchor at full speed? <laughs> I'm surprised that your mast is still intact. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't rip out the anchor or something. <laughs> All right, so let's go check out the shipwreck. Shipwreck, okay, so you're going in, I'm coming Whoa. under. All right, here we are. So this looks like it is a galleon or a frigate. This is a big one. I like, like the name, yeah. the Devil's Rage. Okay, things are looking, I like how the bed is pretty well intact. Take a nice nap. Just floating, <laughs> I noticed. Oh look, check it out. I just found a sapphire gem. Just like you do in real underwater just archaeology. Just like in real life, right? Check this out. Where'd you go? I, <laughs> I don't know I, anyway. I don't know how so long. So Nicole, how lasts. many? So you've dove, how, you've dove on a lot of shipwrecks. How many um, emeralds have you found? I have found a whopping zero emeralds during my many shipwreck dives. What? I thought all shipwrecks had treasure on. Them. Yeah. <laughs> I did. I mean, it's a popular fiction, right? Because it makes them seem romantic and exciting. And shipwrecks, I think, by their nature, are appealing because they're not something that we see every day. Um, and of course, you know, the treasure aspect makes it even more kind of romantic, but well, here's something a little more accurate. Uh, there's tea? a crate, crate of, of rare tea that oh, yeah. would be more accurate to find, right? Sure. Yeah. And that's the kind of the interesting thing about, you know, if we're talking about, you know, kind of early Spanish ships that are carrying goods back and forth from the new world back to Spain, a lot of times what we think of are gold and silver and jewels. And certainly there was a little bit of that because there were active mines in Central and South America producing these kind of goods um, for the Spanish or really the Spanish were exploiting them. But um, some of those really valuable goods were also things like spices and dyes. Right, so it's all different kinds. And of course, we're just talking about, you know, the Atlantic Ocean, the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. There was trade into the Pacific, into the Philippines as well. Um, a lot of people have heard of the famous Manila galleons. They were also bringing valuable goods that weren't necessarily gold, silver and jewels uh, back to Spain for profit. Mm -hmm. Cool. So yeah, th they, they have found some uh, pirate shipwrecks that have been confirmed, not a, not a ton of them, but there's, there's a few that they have found and what's interesting is if you look at the number of, you know, coins that they've recovered, it's like just a few, just a couple. I, th I, on, on, I know at least on the, the three um, more well-known ones, the Queen Anne's Revenge, the Widda uh, Galley, and the Kadaw Merchant, they found very few coins on those shipwrecks. Um, yeah. So uh, even on pirate ships that they've found archaeologically, that just this is not something that you find that they have found a lot of. And that, and that actually matches what we know through the documentary record. And that is that most pirates, of course, you know, they would have loved to have found gems and, you know, treasure chests full of gold coins. But most of what they were actually stealing were the goods on board ship. So like, like tea or like coffee or like sugar or like all the other things that Nicole mentioned. I, I, like, I like to always mention this. There's a shipwreck called the Mardi Gras wreck, which they're not sure if you know it's it's possible that maybe a, uh, I think the latest theory is that it might have been a privateer ship that sank during the war of 1812 and they actually found more coffee beans than they did uh, coins on that shipwreck oh, I think they think found about like how valuable coffee is oh big time especially when you're you know when it's not free trade happening when they're restricting trade and you're only allowed to oh, yeah. uh, trade with your the colonies are only allowed to trade with their um, 
you know, their country of origin, uh, you know, that, that could be really valuable. There were major black markets in the U.S. and other countries and colonies during that period. And, you know, people will pay for luxury goods, coffee definitely being one of them. So then how about this uh, shipwreck? Obviously, this is probably right after it sank. Um, but <laughs> it would seem to me that like in, with the Titanic, didn't that break in half when, once it, I mean, is that common for ships once they sink to, to break to like, apart? To break in half? Well, I guess it depends on how they sank. I mean, this one looks pretty shot up. Looks like it was engaged in some kind of maritime battle. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I think, you know, it, this ship looks like it may have been sunk a couple of months ago. I don't think a shipwreck like this would look like that after five years of being underwater. Um, if a ship was tossed onto a reef or a sandbar after a storm, then a lot of times what we see are cracked keels, which are it's the very bottom of the ship, the part that kind of helps it glide and cut through the water. Um, so it kind of depends on how they sink. I think the Titanic, that one cracked in half, mostly because of the major strain of the weight of that giant metal hulled ship. Uh oh, I see a shark. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you better run, Tristan. You're about to die. <laughs> <laughs> I did find I did find a banana uh, in the uh, in one of the bar barrels, and I I'm actually going to wow. eat it because I'm almost I'm almost dead from. Well, that's why the ship sank. Bananas. Banana. Yeah. Did they, why bananas is that? are notoriously bad luck on ships. Oh, uh -oh. better eat this one too then. You better eat it. Yeah. <laughs> Although I don't know if that was so much the case. I don't know what century we're in right now. Maybe the 17th century or the 18th century, but. Bananas that, historically have been considered bad luck because, and you know, it becomes like a fiction over time, but mostly because fruit and things like that carry bugs on them. And the last thing you want on an enclosed space is lots of bugs and spiders. Uh, yeah. Makes sense. Is, are they still considered bad luck on, on board ships today, bananas? Yeah, I think, you know, in my experience of working with people who are, you know, Navy veterans, uh, there's still some, a good bit of, uh, <laughs> superstition okay superstition. okay i have a, yeah, that's a i have a question then okay if i have like a squeezable that's a pureed banana does, does that count you know i probably can't be the authority on that because i do not have uh, a sailing career but i will say bananas are very good for potassium and as a scuba diver uh, they're a great way of keeping your muscles limber because potassium helps <laughs> oh gosh with traction uh so you know, I like bananas. I don't have a problem with them on ships. I'm also a woman and I'm frequently on ships and that's bad luck too, so. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. if you're gonna tempt fate, tempt it all the way. Right. Yeah, go, don't go halfway. So, so it looks like this ship is not, you know, it's floating, so it's not too deep. So um, how, how deep are shipwrecks? Like how far are shipwrecks down in the ocean? And then what, what's typical for like a scuba diver to work on, on a wreck? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, so, so I guess the easy answer is shipwrecks are basically almost everywhere. Um, anywhere that a ship sails or steams, um, you know, routes tend to hug coastlines. So I think a lot of the shipwrecks that we see are along coastlines in various depths of water. I know in the Gulf of Mexico, where I typically work, we see a lot of our shipwrecks within about 200 feet deep. And that's because that's where the continental shelf is. and when you're sailing, you know, that's kind of hugging the shore, um, but you can also fish in waters like that easily too. But I mean, like I said before, in Pensacola Bay, we have shipwrecks in 13 feet of water that we work on. So, you know, they're, they're kind of all over. There are some very, very deep wrecks, um, Titanic, of course, being an example of those and the Mardi Gras wreck as well that Mike mentioned. Um, those are a little bit deeper and those archeologists do work on ships like that, but the logistics of doing archaeology on shipwrecks like that is much more difficult because it takes a lot more money and technology to do it. Um, and you can't really just go dive on those shipwrecks very easily. So I guess archaeologists are a little bit limited by their ability to dive um, and also, you know, how they're funded for their project. And so, you know, one thing in this game, is obviously we're doing it now, but we're salvaging the shipwreck. Is that something that happened historically without scuba equipment? before scuba equipment was, you know, invented and used. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, especially in Florida, we have some really interesting um, Spanish shipwrecks. Um, many of them were galleons. 
um, on the East Coast. And they were part of what we call the Spanish plate fleets. And again, these were ships that were carrying goods back and forth from Central and South America back to Spain. And um, there's in 1715, we see a bunch of these ships wrecked all along Florida's East Coast. And the, the crews largely survived because it was relatively shallow water and they could just swim to shore for the most part. Um, but they did salvage a lot of the materials from those ships. So I don't, they didn't have sophisticated diving equipment, obviously, but you know, they were sailors, they could hold their breath and they could swim and, you know, free dive. Yeah. <laughs> Another job that I would not volunteer for. And they probably, <laughs> they probably didn't, I know enslaved, uh, uh, native people were actually used on some of those salvaging expeditions. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, well, as well as the mining. So. Um, I'm sure that's probably part of the reason, like who would want to do that voluntarily. Yeah. Be dangerous. I... Well, okay. I think this, I mean, this shipwreck's cool. I guess the, the only other thing to ask about wrecked and, and you've kind of mentioned, you know, we've talked about how, um, far down it's been, but, um, you know, I think people have that image of, and we call it like the Disney version of a sh what a shipwreck looks like. And, uh, and you mentioned this too, as, as you can see that in some places like in the great lakes region but you know why is that why do we look at shipwrecks in like the gulf of mexico and caribbean sea and then in the great lakes and they look so different even though they may be around the same age yeah that's a really good question um you know it largely has to do with the environment you know archaeologists and archaeology is all about um you know human history and cultural heritage but the environment and understanding the environment is a really important part of what we do too um, so, for example, in the Gulf of Mexico and in Florida waters in general, um, the waters are very warm and they're very rich with life. And any organic materials, wood being one of them, that ends up in the water for a long time usually gets picked apart by critters in the water. And so a lot of the wrecks that we have in Florida, a lot of that organic material is gone after, you know, if, if we're talking about, you know, pirate ships or Spanish ships um, from the colonial period, then several hundred years, it's just it ends up getting eaten by worms and bored in by mussels and other shellfish. Well, uh, so I that's noticed. one of the reasons why they look so different here in Florida. Florida too has very shallow water and a very dynamic coastline. So we see big storms and hurricanes rolling through. And if a ship is wrecked close to shore, it's just getting beaten up <laughs> and tossed around over however many hundred years. So. That's another reason why they look a little more beat down than the shipwrecks in the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes, obviously, when a ship would sink, probably due to a storm, a violent storm on the Great Lakes, it's going to sink a lot deeper because those lakes are a lot deeper. And it's also very cold, almost anaerobic environment. Now, anaerobic meaning, you know, without oxygen and without the ability to foster a lot of life. So that's why we see such excellent preservation on some of those wrecks. In well, the in the Great Lakes. Here's another question for you. Yeah. One of the things I found on that wreck was this glowing skull. <laughs> How many uh, of those? <laughs> yeah. Or, put it back, or, put or it back, more accurately, <laughs> human remains. Uh, what's the likelihood? Oh. What would the process be if you're finding human remains? Yeah, that's a good question. It's not really something I've had to contend with yet. I guess uh, fortunately, we know that. On uh, some of the wrecks that I've worked on, there certainly has been loss of life, but none of the remains have been identified or, or recovered or seen. Um, but of course, you know, in Florida and in most places in the world, if there are human remains on an archaeological site, uh, they are protected, 100% protected, no matter what time period we're talking about. And so what we would do as archaeologists is probably stop work. Um, there would probably be an investigation just to make sure that the remains aren't actually modern remains and part of a crime scene. Um, and kind of depends from there on what the determination is. So I know there are shipwrecks, uh, archaeologists, colleagues have worked on, like in Texas, for example, on a French shipwreck called the La Belle. Um, they identified the remains of some French sailors on that shipwreck. And eventually those remains were, of course, you know, they were excavated and collected and then eventually repatriated uh, back to France and back to the families if they could identify them. I know there were some efforts to do that, hmm. but in most cases, cool. yeah, re we, what we would do what we call repatriation, which is provide it back to the families or the country of origin. Yeah, I, I remember reading something recent about the LaBelle and they had done some DNA. And I believe one of the human remains they 
uh, found and tested was actually Native American. And they think that it may have been a, a, a like later on um, them salvaging it and he possibly got caught and maybe drowned, I think is the yeah. current theory. And I know at the, um, the, the Witta, that's uh, Sam Bellamy's pirate ship that was uh, found off the, the northeastern coast in a Cape, I think Cape Cod. Off Cape Cod. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they actually found the leg bone um, with a, with still inside the boot. And it, I think they determined that it was one of the boys that had been on the ship and drowned oh, right. after it wrecked. Um, yep. And I'm not sure what, what they did with those remains. I'm sure they probably buried them or something or, you know, went through that process. Yeah. Although the, the guy who found that, um, I don't believe he was a professional archeologist. Gary Clifford. No, yeah. Is his name? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, but uh, anyways, well, maybe we should uh, pull the anchor up and and go check some other stuff out. Sure. I was just going to add one wreck I know of that had human remains. It's not quite as near as old as this. Is the Hunley? Oh yeah, the Hunley. Yeah. The Hunley is uh, for those who aren't aware is the first successful submarine attack and that they sunk a ship not in that they survived the attack um it was recovered in mobile bay right uh no not mobile it was i think they they it, it had um been built near mobile bay or there's some connection there they were, so. um they were in charleston harbor okay yeah. when they there we go. Yeah. but anyway they they basically all died in that submarine and there was recovered and a lot of information from that as a whole so really yeah. cool thing to look up if you're interested in that yeah. civil it war was, era submarine it, it sunk um during the civil war the uss houstonic and then they accidentally sank themselves as well. yeah well i i think i know what we should do i mean this is a pirate game and like in real life there's got to be buried treasure on some of these islands somewhere right right because they I were just leaving so. their treasure everywhere yeah, they just buried it. I regularly leave my treasure <laughs> buried. <in place. laughs> I mean, I mean, because then all they had to do was use, uh, you know, their GPS to <laughs> to mark the coordinates and then go back and find it. So one thing on this game, there are maps and there is a, a there's actually a compass by the helm or the wheel uh, that allows you to get around. So maybe, uh, what about ship navigation during this this time period? Nicole, can you tell us a little bit about how people would have actually navigated? during yeah. Uh, the sale. Yeah, that's a really good question. So I guess it kind of depends on what time period we're actually talking about in this game. And I'm not, <laughs> I'm getting mixed messages from the game, so I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's between the 1500s and the 1900s. Any, <laughs> anywhere, it's basically uh -huh. in between there. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, if, you know, for the most part, we were relying on celestial objects, right? So the sun, the moon, and the stars. And there were various instruments that people would have been able to use. And of course, you know, compasses are very important as well, finding magnetic north. Um, but depending on what time period we're actually talking about, um, there, we only had the ability to get or use coordinates in one way. Um, at, during that time period. So that's that's one of the reasons why the celestial objects are so important. Although the problem with that, of course, is if you have a cloudy day or cloudy night, you're gonna have a really hard time navigating. Uh, I'm trying to find, I've got a good little story here that I was gonna read. I should have pulled it up before we start. Well, we know they definitely had is because those have been around a really long time so those oh, yeah. were certainly useful during this time so we're looking um, at the the map here and is this is, where, it, is that where there's treasure we haven't picked a quest so we'll have to just oh, we're, try we're and now. see okay. well but what we could do you notice the people who are watching you can see the ship moving around and of course that wouldn't be things what, what was going on so you'd actually have to plot that yourself mm. you'd have to use the the tools and the, the stars like Nicole was talking about to figure out where you were and what route you were taking and hopefully and where Tris, the reef Tris, was. You've been, you've been marking this all down in our log, right? Yes, every, every, every log single. As we're going. That's important. Well, yes. one of the interesting things is, you know, a lot of, you know, if we're talking about that kind of 
age of exploration and discovery, you know, latitude was something that you could fairly easily keep track of because of the sun, moon, and the stars. Um, but longitude was a big problem for people. And you couldn't actually calculate longitude easily before um, the invention of chronometers and other devices later on. So for the most part, you had to find your latitude and then keep heading east or west, right? So you would find your location north and south, and then you would basically have to dead reckon until you hit the spot that you were looking for, which is kind of interesting. Just, yeah, just eyeballing it. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you, you know yeah, that, you know, for example, Florida is on the 41 degree latitude line, right? So mm -hmm. you just, once you clock that in on your, on your uh, sextant or your quadrant, you can just head, you keep heading east until you hit Florida or west rather, sorry, if you're coming right. from Europe. Yeah, so navigation on this game is much easier. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah. We basically have a GPS on the map, essentially. Yeah, it, re it wasn't really until almost 1800 that longitude was a thing that you could calculate while sailing. So for, there was a long period of time where you didn't have the ability to really accurately plot yourself while you were sailing. So that's a very, I know, I know in some pirate ships, um, you know, of course, uh, a lot of a lot of the crew would volunteer, but some of them, at least, claim later in court cases when they were being tried that they were not volunteers; that they had been forced to serve on board these ships against their will, and they would never do something like that if they hadn't been forced to by threat of death. But a lot of times, when they did um, force people, force sailors to serve on these pirate ships, they tended to be people like surgeons or like uh, you know navigators, people with map skills, because it was such a such a difficult thing to do and not every not every sailor could do that yeah well most sailors i guess you know they weren't going to have those education that people who could do map making or you know accounting had whoa so, yeah, look at they, this volcano you're gonna get <laughs> us you're gonna get us sunk here i feel like we're too close yes christian get man the bilge <laughs> <laughs> that only brings water in you're going to need a bigger pump. Oh, man. Yeah, and so in this game, I know you're... One thing when this game first came out is, of course, if, if we do find another ship, then we can maybe try to engage it in battle. But uh, ships now in this game can catch on fire. And so mm. if you catch it on fire, you got to put it out. So That's a problem for a wooden vessel. Yes, definitely. <laughs> so um, we've been talking about shipwrecks. Um, what about underwater archaeology that isn't shipwrecks. For example, Barbara had a story in Lake Wisconsin. Her family owned a property where they found old carriages and horse skeletons at the bottom. And what they were doing is they were going out and harvesting ice in this oh, case. Wow. And then I guess occasionally they would fall through. But I know that there's other cases where it's not just shipwrecks you're studying too, right? Oh yeah, I mean underwater archaeology, we, we tend to think of shipwrecks because that's commonly what we find, but underwater archaeology actually spans quite a bit. Um, there are obviously other kinds of uh, travel technology, <laughs> and by that I mean airplanes. There are also airplane wreckages. Um, one of the n kind of new and to me very interesting uh, fields, or not really field, but like uh, topics of interest in underwater archaeology are ancient landscapes. And essentially what archaeologists are doing is they're looking at the underwater landscape, right? And they're trying to figure out what it would have looked like 10,000, 20,000 years ago um, to try and find archaeological sites from some of the very first people living at least here in the United States during that time period. So that's been really exciting. And while, you know, it, it obviously takes a lot of time and money and technology to do those kinds of things, because we're often talking about very deep parts of our oceans and rivers and, and in some cases, lakes. Uh, there are some other sites that in Florida that have been discovered that uh, date to, you know, the seven to 10,000 possibly even 14,000 year period, um, just offshore and then in some of our freshwater springs as well. Freshwater springs, a lot of people hadn't really thought about those as places for good archeology, span but 
people throughout history have needed fresh water to drink, right? So, and as water levels fluctuate over time, you know, those places capture artifacts and sometimes remains, and they've been excellent places to study that period of time really, really long time ago. Well, perfect, thank you. Yeah. So let's check out this shipwreck. Yeah, I was gonna, oh, okay, yeah, let's check it out. This looks now. maybe a little more authentic for Here we go. You ready? shipwreck, right? Anchor, lower the anchor. Just like you would at full speed. <laughs> yeah, with your sail fully unfurled. Damn. Yes. There we go. Perfect. I'm going to check this island out, too. Um, and also, I'm looking, I was looking on the horizon for any sails. I haven't seen any. But maybe we'll fire the cannon at something anyway. That's a pretty accurate looking shipwreck right there. Yeah, that's what I thought. Only I like probably you'd one. see it more buried, typically, mm -hmm. right? At, so for sure. a more recent shipwreck, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe that's something to talk about too. So obviously this one's been probably uh, washed up on the on the shore. How how typical is is that to find shipwrecks actually washed up on shore like this? Um, it's actually pretty common. Um, you know, if we're talking about Florida, which we have been a lot, uh, Florida again, lots of storms, really dynamic coastline, because ships tend to hug coastal routes when there's a bad storm, they sometimes will get tossed up onto islands, barrier islands or beaches. And in Florida, that happens. There are wrecks all over the state that are kind of covered and uncovered on our beaches. And I sometimes feel bad because people will call and say, oh, we've discovered a new shipwreck on the beach over here. And I always feel bad telling them that, no, we've known about that one for, you know, at least the last 80 years. But it is really <laughs> interesting. And it's, it's a good way to kind of engage people with the archaeology. So I appreciate those opportunities. Hey guys, I uh, I did something I probably shouldn't have. I uh, came on the beach and I started using my shovel to dig stuff, and I found something. Whoa, skeletons? Yeah. Oh gosh, they can get up here. Oh, oh no. I would say I that's not accurate. It's not oh, accurate. You've never had to deal with skeletons. <laughs> <laughs> He's mad. It, maybe he, it's because I was trying to dig up his treasure. Um, yeah, it's probably her, her treasure. Her treasure. They're Looking probably her. actually protecting the archaeology, Mike. They probably That's are. True. We should archaeology defenders. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we need some of those. <laughs> oh, I'm out of ammo. Me I'm too. gonna go back to my ship or our ship. So yeah, I mean, um, sorry. Go ahead. You want to say something? Um, so. One thing that we've talked about too, I mean, talking about these shipwrecks being uh, found and washed out on shore, mainly from you know storm activity, um, but and we've talked about kind of some of the environmental conditions and what helps preserve them. Uh, how about like with global temperature rising, sea level rise? How is that? Does that is that going to affect shipwrecks at all? I mean, with with the, at least the warming of the waters. Yeah, that's a, a super interesting question for a couple of different reasons. A lot of people think, you know, underwater archaeology sites, how are they going to be impacted? They're already underwater, you know. But there's a lot of other kind of components to climate change that would affect underwater archaeological sites. One of the big ones that we see is what we call ocean acidification. And this is kind of a uh, it's a it's the acidification of ocean waters due to changing levels of, of carbon, right, and carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And this can affect the preservation of different types of artifacts on shipwrecks, um, especially metal artifacts. Um, but it can also affect the sea life that tends to protect shipwrecks. So in Florida, shipwrecks, when they sink, they're almost instantly colonized by creatures, right? So soft corals, hard corals, um, anything, you know, starfish, you name it, fish, it's on the shipwreck. And so ocean acidification will affect those particular critters, especially uh, what we call calciferous um, organisms that have a lot of um, calcium and carbonate in their shells, like corals and shellfish. And when those things colonize shipwrecks, they actually tend to preserve the wreck because they essentially cover it up from other organisms and from the effects of the saltwater environment. And if we start to see less of those organisms, we might see less uh, preservation on those shipwreck sites. So that's kind of one effect. But another thing we think about too with climate change is the increased frequency and severity of storms. And this is already a problem in Florida, but if we're talking 
more storms that are more violent, we're going to start to see a lot of damage to our coastal shipwreck sites. So we could see things start to wear down much more quickly. And those are kind of just two examples. There are other ways, you know, when we talk about sure. climate change impacts that would affect shipwrecks. But yeah, that's a really good question. And one terrible thing that happened is I was blown up by skeletons. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm coming back to life. I don't know why it's taking a while to load. Oh, there we go. I'm back on our ship. All right. <laughs> Man. Well, do you want to sail around? We, we've got a few more minutes. Uh, I think about five more minutes. Do you want to uh, sail around a little bit more, see if we can find something else? Try another island, maybe. See what's try, there. Maybe try another island. I like some of these islands. They actually have some um, rock art actually oh yeah yeah and sometimes they're used as clues for figuring out like where the treasure is at or something where the buried but, treasure is but and, i also just think it's kind of cool to just run around and you see like a guy with a son you know or something and it's there's some nice touches right yeah and i will say that buried treasure and pirates although it's you know in every single fictionalized version of anything ever written about pirates um is it's only been documented a couple times, at least in the historic record. So it wasn't something that was very common. But it, it makes for it, such a good story, I think it Mike. happened twice that I know of that's been actually documented. So not, uh, not a normal thing for pirates to do. Well, I wish we could have found a, uh, a storm, because that would have been fun. Uh, kind of there's fun. one. Do you see one? You're my eyes, man. Um, this this sail is blocking on, my view. Trying to make sure I have my nautical turns to the starboard. <laughs> starboard. All right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Don't want to embarrass myself in front of the underwater archaeologist. <laughs> the big cloud right ahead. Okay, I'm I'm pointing the bow. Is that right? <laughs> right. Of the ship. Yep. Yeah. Okay, I see some lightning. Okay, this one. Yeah. This will be good. And we're pretty much with the wind so is that so we've seen it we've seen a couple wrecks so far you know the one washed up and then the one we explored the first one that obviously had been sunk through some sort of engagement uh with another ship and if it was a pirate ship that sank it, it would probably um lost to a naval vessel which usually if, if they were going to lose to a ship it was going to be against a naval ship um but what what are the more common ways that ships actually sank I mean, was it just mainly through naval engagements or, um, you know, we talked about wrecking on reefs too. Yeah, I mean, I guess it, it kind of just depends on when you're talking about, where you're talking about. I mean, naval, I mean, you know, during the, the colonial periods in the Atlantic world, obviously people were constantly fighting each other. So I would say naval engagement probably was relatively common, but I, storms are probably the biggest offender for shipwrecks. There were storms everywhere happening all the time. And you know, the hurricane season didn't really stop trade. They just had to do their best to avoid those really bad storms. I guess one of the big problems too is, you know, we talked about navigation, the lack of some things like GPS, um, not being able to know exactly where super shallow reefs or sandbars were, that could be a huge problem for someone who's hugging the coast. Yeah, I guess if you don't have like a Doppler radar then you see this, you basically know the storm's coming when you see it on the horizon. Yeah. And you know, these, I mean, we probably are not giving sailors enough credit. These, these people spent their lives on the water. So they knew, you know, things to look out for with a storm, but that, you know, didn't always stop squalls and things from popping up. Red, what is it? Red light, red sky in the morning, sailor's warning. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if that's real or if that's a landlubber <laughs> thing, actually. Is that the banana thing? <laughs> <laughs> got more tristan i i really Red hope sky you... at night sailor's delight yeah put your banana away tristan we're going into this storm i, I have five <laughs> of them into right it. now the safest place to be is in a storm <laughs> in the storm with your banana yeah with the banana the what yep. else is bad luck and we've got a we've got a female on board yep we're good we have an explosive right next to our mast. That's Can I tell you good. something that bothers me about this ship? Yes, please. Yes, please do. So yeah. the, the hull planking or like the, the deck planking there that we see, 
It's really patchy, and yeah. I've never seen. <laughs> Nicole, have you seen our shoes in this game? <laughs> I just have never seen anything that patchy. Yeah, I wonder why they did that. You know, it's looks more visually interesting. No wonder this thing leaks all the time. Yeah, <laughs> let's actually look at. We're, we are obviously. Low. I mean, you know, there was there was different levels of success for pirates, and you know, of course, the more successful you were, the wealthier you were, but a lot of them were not successful and they didn't like make a lot of money and they didn't have really nice ships and they were just like kind of petty criminals um going around it's, it's kind of interesting that we we like like i guess we do the same thing with the mafia we kind of glorify this this act of criminality and crime but of course to the victims during the time it wasn't funny you know mm -hmm. i'm yeah. sure it wasn't funny now so it's kind of interesting how we and again, we do the same thing with the mafia, I guess. Maybe not so much as, like, when I was a kid, it was more of a, you know, kind of looked up to mafia members in movies and in comic books. Except for Spider-Man. That guy was a, the, the mob boss was a bad guy, right? Yeah. But, well, we are just at uh, 11 o'clock, so that's, that's our hour. It went by fast go by fast. Yeah. It is not No Man's Sky, see. Hank, although I think I have it correctly tagged, so this time I've got it right. I hope. Yeah, well, I guess um, maybe, Tristan, we should get our instruments out and, and play a song while we're sailing into the storm like like all pirates do. Mm -hmm. what, what, sh what shanty do you want? Let's try an actual shanty. Something okay. that may you, actually you, be a shanty. You pick one. Okay, let's see. Do you recognize any Nicole? Um, Jolly good fellow. <laughs> I, you know, you're heading into a storm. I feel like Ride of the Valkyries is a good oh, one. Oh, this is what a good suggestion. Well, <laughs> <laughs> this is so appropriate. Well, I'm sorry uh, we didn't <laughs> engage any pirate ships, but, you know, this is the life of a pirate. You know, a lot of the times it would take months before they would come across a merchant ship that they could actually steal. And we are headed right for an island, so we yeah. might actually wreck our ship here. Someone didn't this leave the steer the the wheel straight. Oh, well, well, I wanted to thank uh, uh, Nicole for joining us, being our special guest or featured guest for playing this game Sea of Thieves today for our second episode. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, the next scheduled archaeology arcade that we have is actually next. Was it next Thursday, Tristan? Uh, yes, right. yes, next Thursday. Yeah, we're bringing Rachel Hines back. We're, we, uh, we're going to pick up where we left off on our Nancy Drew game. Uh, so that'll be a lot of fun. But I think overall, this is a really fun pirate game. Uh, obviously, a lot of inaccuracies. Uh, we were never really able to tell what time period this is. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, but I, I think it's a kind of cool game. What do you guys think? Yeah. Yeah, I had lots of fun. We may have to do this again sometime. Yeah, definitely. Maybe next time we can actually try to see if we can engage another ship in, uh, in battle. Definitely. And, and fail miserably at it, I'm sure. Because <laughs> there's probably a bunch oh. of... Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> there's probably a bunch of, uh, you know, eight-year-olds oh, that are really that. good at this game. <laughs> and there she goes. There shouldn't we he, go. Shouldn't have, shouldn't have brought that banana on board. Yep, yeah. it was the banana. <laughs> Bad luck. All right, yeah, well, thanks, thanks everybody. Nicole. Thanks, yeah, everybody. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. And thanks to everybody on Twitch. And then we should uh, we should be putting this up on our Facebook channel as uh, episode two. So we'll see you next next week. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>